It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. You're listening to us in your neighborhood, from coast to coast, and around the world. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Joan Herman, author, speaker, and your host. For four years, Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life has been bringing you interviews with some of the most inspirational and influential people in the world. It's our goal to educate and empower you so you can live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. We have another great show for you today. Joining me is celebrity relationship expert, matchmaker, and Oprah's ambassador of love, Kaylin Rosenberg. Kaylin is the author of the book, Real Love Right Now. She's here today to teach us how to get past the things that keep us from finding real, authentic love. Welcome, Kaylin. Thanks for joining us today. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Kaylin, anyone that is looking for a relationship or is already in a committed relationship, That person wants to find deep love, and we want to be with someone that loves us completely, supports us, is our best friend. And with the divorce rate so high today and infidelity on the rise, what do you think is happening in our relationships? Well, you know, to start with, we have really, excuse me, we've lost track of our of our true selves. We, and many of us have never even met um, our our true self. We have sort of gone on in life, um, sort of having become the person that we thought we were meant to be. And with that, ended up taking on roles and experiences and then relationships that we were never meant to have. And so until we are able to really get raw and real and and gentle with ourselves and and to start doing a little bit of healing and some tweaking of forgiveness with ourselves, um, until we're able to do that, it's, it's going to be difficult to have the love we deserve and to show up in a relationship that deserves love, um, you know, in a healthy way. And... So when we start with ourselves and we get rid of a lot of that stuff that we're holding on to, and most of us, again, unknowingly, we start to attract, as you know, just the most amazing loving energy from all different directions, and it's not necessarily just romantic love. It, it shifts us, you know, in our workplace. It shifts when we're, you know, we're waiting for the bus or the, the subway or sitting in traffic. But as we're sitting in our relationships, even in a marriage that feels really broken and painful and lonely and empty, and sadly way too many people are sitting in that situation, it does not mean that there isn't hope. It does not mean that it cannot be turned around and we can have amazing love all over again within something that feels really painful and really lost. No different than being single and feeling like you've just had one failed relationship or disappointing relationship after another, and you just get to the point of where it's almost exhausting, I will hear. And um, you just have to know that um, typically when that's happening, there are blocks and areas of sabotage that are up that we are actually doing, and um, it is as simple as finding a way to hone it in and to find peace again and to completely change it and make it different. The interesting thing is that you're saying it begins with us and and so many of us. I mean, we love to blame everyone else for whatever's going on. It's that person's fault and he cheated on me and she did this, blah, blah, blah. So what does it take for us to really look within and see our role in the relationships? Well, it, you know, it takes getting rid of the fear first. We, our egos are pretty powerful things, and, and they, they feel like they're there to protect us, but really what they do is they keep us stuck. And so we have to really push that darn ego aside, that thing that, that, thing that wants to keep us from our own truths of, of what needs to change and, and really could be a lot healthier and better, and we need to start just owning it. And, you know, as we become aware of that behavior, shifting that behavior to um, really to a healthier place. And, you know, yes, it is so easy to, to cast that blame and that judgment and that criticism on our partner or on all the singles being messed up or, you know, the world being a screwed up place. We can just shift, shift, shift all this energy mm-hmm. and, and accountability. And when really, again, it, it all comes down to us. We are continually the, the con, you know, the common denominator. And um, it doesn't mean that other people can't do hurtful things or cruel things, but what we have to remember, and this might sound kind of strange, we actually, even though it's, it's painful stuff, we have to try to come from a place of, and this is really coming from a higher spiritual place, but it has, we have to come from a place of compassion because, as we know, and we've heard the term many times, hurt people hurt people. And so when people are acting out and they're not acting from their higher self and they're doing things to those that they say or claim they love that are, that are painful for them, they're in pain themselves. They're in a major disconnect from themselves, and, and they're lost. 
and they and their egos are just you know kind of consuming them and so we have these relationships that once started out so pure and genuinely in love that ended up just in these toxic messes and it wasn't because they didn't love each other it was because they just got lost and you know controlled by the wrong thing and um, and again even with our own behavior it's just it, if we can learn to start shifting to compassion understanding and forgiveness and overall what love means that in itself heals so much, if not everything. But um, sometimes that even sounds a little bit too Pollyanna for people, and you know. Mm-hmm. But yet, it's 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 true. It works. It, it, I've you know I've seen it for twenty some years in my own life and in my clients' lives and thousands of lives actually that I've worked with, and uh, and it keeps me inspired and it keeps me excited to do what I do every day. You're offering this advice, and you say that it's also important for us to take a physical, mental, and emotional self appraisal. How does someone go about doing this? What are some strategies that you can offer to get someone started? Well, you know, again, get really real with yourself. So do you really like who you are? And, of course, we always start out on a superficial level. We think about, do we, you know, do we like the way we look? Do we like our hair? Do we like our body? Blah, blah, blah. Do we like our job? Do we have enough money in the bank? Yet, as we know, at the end of the day, those are, none of those are the things that have anything to do with real love um, or lasting love or committed love. So, but we have to start somewhere. So, you know, a physical appraisal. Do you know? Do we like who we are? Do we like how we look? Does the, the way that we present ourselves to the world is it is it honoring our true core of who we really are and what we're about and and what we want others to see, you know, and to see into us for. Um, as well as then going deeper and and looking at the spiritual sense. Do we have a higher power that we're connected to, or, or are we our highest power? Sometimes that can be quite dangerous and. Um, you know, we need to take a, a, a step back and look at the relationships that surround us and the type of relationships they have. Are we surrounded by people that are of joy and of love, or is it filled with toxic, you know, energy and conversation and and gossip and drama? And um, it, it's just it's a true heavy duty <laughs> self appraisal inside and out to, to get it as clear and as straight and as as, as pure and good and loving as possible. Um, because at the end of the day, it it. Uh, it's real stuff, and it works, and it makes such a huge difference. And um, this, you know, this whole world really needs it. We we can all shift everything that's happening if we, you know, if each one of us just starts focusing more on on the good things and the pure things and the loving things. So, Kaylin, once we take this self evaluation and, and we take stock of, of our role in what's been going on in our life, and we start to make changes, we change the things we can immediately, and we start to make more lasting changes or working toward them anyway. What next? How do we put ourselves out there to find someone? Yeah. Well, we need to be darn open-minded. I, I I hear way too often about how, you know, each person is expecting to meet their partner at a certain place at a certain time and a mm-hmm. certain location. It's like, no, 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 Get rid of that. You have no idea where your soulmate is or your next, your, your partner that you're meant to be with is. So, so whenever you are around human beings, you are potentially next to your potential soulmate. And um, as long as you have that kind of loving awareness and energy and you're feeling really good and wonderful and sexy and, and just really spiritually fulfilled within yourself, you're radiating that energy wherever you go. Again, whether you're, you know, whether you're pumping gas or you're at the grocery store, you're standing in line at Starbucks, you know, your, your babe could be right next to you and they'll feel your energy and, and a con- you know, a connection and a conversation will start. It happens all the time once people are open to it. So be open. Don't be afraid of or judge how you meet each other. Just uh, be open to the natural energy and making sure that each of you throw, or show up authentically. And um, and also, my Lord, don't rush love. If love is if love is there and it's present and it's real, it's not going anywhere. Just trust in the moment. Um, seek to 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 find out you know who each person is in each potential relationship. Let it happen organically. And um, honest to God, the rest will fall into place. But there are just way too many people that are afraid to be alone. They're desperate to push that darn relationship, especially women, mm-hmm. my Lord. They have to stop doing that. And um, and just let love show up, and, and it will. Just don't be afraid of it. Don't try to control it. It will show up. I promise. And be the person you want to attract. Yeah. There, yes. Amen. Kaylin, how important is it for us to visualize who and what we want? I have a friend who actually made a list of the characteristics that she was looking for in a person. And it took a couple of years, but she met this guy and he is everything that she wanted. So do you believe that we can visualize and create what we want to attract? Oh, with everything. Yeah. 
And, I, and it's, I'm glad to hear that it turned out positive. We have to be careful with that because if we aren't in the right place with ourselves and, our, and the right mindset, we can create this list of what we believe we want from our ego's point of view and just end up attracting a total disaster. But yes, do put it out there when you know what you want and, and who you should be attracted to and who you should not be attracted to and why. And you're also showing up in, in the really the healthiest and the best and the most beautiful light for, for your soul and your spirit then, yeah, have at it and, and put that list together. And, you know, in my book, I talk about creating a vision board for your soulmate and even a love blueprint for, you know, the type of soulmate and man or woman that you want to bring into your life. And honest to God, it happens. But you're right. You have to put that intention out, as with everything. Now, Kaylin, you spoke about going out there too early, being desperate, feeling the fear of being alone. What are some other common bad dating habits that people have? What other mistakes are they making that are that's really a roadblock to them finding what they want? Texting. I I, I had I don't know, a handful of clients this last week. Every issue was over texting, and and yet. The women allow this. The women. This is a safe little way for the men to kind of play. It's like cat and mouse. Not mm-hmm. their intention, typically, for most. And I, I mean, I'm not kidding. I've talked to thousands of men and women singles about this. Um, but the women will allow the men to get into this form of texting as the main communication, even though they don't like it and it feels lonely right off the bat. They are already holding on desperately to that next text that they hope not only comes, but that might say, I can't wait to see you again. That already is a sign that the woman, or even if a man is doing this, is not ready. They're not ready. It doesn't mean that it's months or years off, but there's something that they need to shift within themselves. So, uh, you know, texting is okay 10% of the time, but no more than that. It's like, get on the darn phone. Let me hear your voice. Let me hear your energy. Let's let's be real. Let's be adults with each other, and let's plan our next get-together. And I would say the next thing after texting would be, um, to not get into the rut of the same darn romantic date over and over and over again, because that's not reality. We, we want to see who this person really is and if we can fit into their lives and vice versa. So if we're constantly going out to a romantic dinner and having two bottles of wine and we're ending up in bed, yeah, that, that's fun and exciting and enticing, but there's, there's very little that is, that is real raw or um, informative about mm-hmm. that. Um, and so um, I talk, in, you know, really in my book, I talk a lot about needing 10 specific unique dates and letting each person take a turn in um, creating and, and sort of designing them and showing up for the next date and revealing who you really are in many different levels so that, you know, because this is going to be your partner in life. This is going to be, you know, your playmate, your buddy. Kaylin, in the book, you write about going love shopping. What is that? Sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it's, it's fun and it's interesting. It kind of blows my clients' minds. Um, you know, love shopping is, is something that I, uh, it's a process I designed many years ago just sort of by accident and then for fun, and then I realized, wow, it really works, but I, I, I will bring my client into a place filled with lots of people of the opposite sex or whatever based on where they're at in life, and and um, and I will, you know, I'll say, okay, I want you to point out the first three people that, are, you know, are your type, that catch your eye and your catch your attention, and people do that with no problem. Oh, my gosh, that person, of course, look at how hot he is or sexy or handsome or look at how beautiful she is or... And then I basically we go through levels and levels and layers of this process of elimination where we get to the point of where my client is dumped in a little bit upset with me saying, okay, there's not one person in this room that I'm attracted to. There's no one. And then I'll say, okay, now get out of your ego. I want you to look with your heart. Just saying that, their energy shifts and they know what I'm talking about. And every single time I have tried this process with my client, they will find somebody and it's the funniest thing and they will just stare and just kind of gleam over at this person as if it's the most amazing person they've ever seen, the stranger from across the room. And they'll, and I'll say, why is it that you chose that person? And the answer is always based on something really deep and beautiful and warm and engaging. It's about how they, they notice how this person is connecting with the people they're talking to, that they're fully engaged, that they have a warmth about them, that there's a softness about them. It's completely away from the ego. And this whole love shopping process shifts my clients into looking at the kind of people that they selected in the past. And it doesn't mean that you don't need to or deserve to be attracted to the partner you're with. It just shifts it to uh, a level of a higher, healthier importance so that you get all of the goods at once, if that makes sense. Kaylin, very quickly before we run out of time, we spoke about how in divorce is on the increase and more and more people are finding themselves alone. And Usually when a situation like that occurs, someone gets hurt, someone's heart is broken. So how does someone get past the fear of feeling that they can't trust another person again and and even getting past that feeling like they're damaged, like they're never going to be able to be in a loving relationship? What would you say to that person? Well, number one, they're not damaged. And um, what I say to them is that if, if this person was not meant to be in their life, 
for marriage or for the rest of their life, that that's okay. It might hurt. It might be painful. It might be confusing. But if they can learn to look at that person as a love teacher, because I believe we have many love teachers until we meet our soulmate, and in an odd way they're actually blessed because now they're in the position, the opportunity to honestly finally meet the person that they, that has always been waiting for them, that has been thinking about them somewhere in their mind, whether it's you know 10 miles away, it's across the country, it's out of your person is still there. You just have not met them yet. And so it's almost in an odd way, thank the person that you just divorced. Thank them for the loving times. Thank you. Thank them for the times that had value, that had lessons, that had even pain where you could learn about yourself, learn about what you what you deserve and what you don't deserve. Get grounded in that, heal in that, and then be fully prepared. And you can be for your guy or for your gal. I mean, seriously. You just haven't found the right one yet. It's okay. They were your love teacher. It's all right. The book is Real Love Right Now, 30-Day Blueprint for Finding Your Soulmate and So Much More by Kaylin Rosenberg. If you'd like more information about Kaylin and her work, you can visit the websites thelovearchitects.com or realloverightnow.com. Kaylin, thank you for spending time with us. Sounds like this weekend I'm going to go love shopping. The heck with shoe shopping. This sounds like a lot more fun. (laughs) I love it. I love it. (laughs) We'll be right back. It's time for this week's Medical Minutes. Joining me today is Dr. Michael Gross, the Medical Director of the Active Center for Health and Wellness, the founder of Active Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, and the Chief of Sports Medicine at Hackensack University Medical Center in Hackensack, New Jersey. Dr. Gross is the author of the new book, Get Well Soon. Welcome, Dr. Gross. Thanks for joining us today. Joan, thank you for inviting me. Dr. Gross, as a sports medicine physician, you've seen active people come in for treatment, and you've seen the not-so-active people. What are the risks that are associated with living a sedentary lifestyle? Some of them are obvious. Weight gain, high blood pressure, cardiac problems. Some of them are less obvious. We now know that the number one factor that controls the progression of osteoarthritis in the knee is weight gain. So if someone can control their weight, can lose weight, they can slow the progression of arthritis in their knees. We know that 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week will decrease the incidence of certain cancers. So an active lifestyle is very important in maintaining your health and your wellness. For someone who hasn't been active in years, does that person lose muscle and and the ability? I mean, is there atrophy that goes on so that when they start to get involved in a program, they really need to rebuild a lot of what they've lost over those years? Well, muscle weakness, atrophy, loss of coordination, loss of balance is a normal part of aging. If you've been sedentary, those problems are exacerbated. So certainly, if somebody begins to exercise and is starting on an exercise program, they have to start small. But remember, we talked about 150 minutes of moderate exercise. That doesn't represent a big commitment. And that can be something as simple as taking the stairs rather than an elevator, of walking to work, of going for a walk after dinner, of doing moderate work around the house. So we're not talking about necessarily going to the gym and exercising hard for an hour and a half. That's not the picture people should have in their head. Now, doctor, that is for an adult. But what about our children? We are raising kids today that are they're actually sicker than ever before. They're going to die younger. And these are, these are kids that literally spend hours in a sedentary lifestyle playing video games on their computer. I mean, it's so much different than when we were young and we went out to play. So what can we do for our children to get them active and get them living a healthier lifestyle? Well, I think we have to take the game controllers out of their hands. And I think we have to send them outside and make sure they do stuff. But we've become a much more organized society. The days where we used to send kids down to the park and tell them to play until dark, those days are gone. So we have to encourage kids to go out for at least an hour a day. And the NFL is very active in programs like that. All the professional athletic associations are encouraging kids to be active. And I think we have to start kids from an early age having an active, healthy lifestyle. One of the ways we can do that is by setting a good example, not just send a kid out by themselves, but maybe get involved in an activity with them. And that will help them to get involved and get started and may make you closer to your kids as well. Now, Dr. Gross, what about an active person? How can that person prevent injury? 
I think any active person runs the risk of injury if they're overdoing their exercise. There are injuries that come from overtraining. So we have to make sure that we're doing things in a moderate fashion and we're doing them correctly. So warming up before you exercise or before you perform a sporting activity is important. Stretching is important. And then cooling down and stretching afterwards. Never doing too much two days in a row. Hard days and easy days prevent overtraining. So too much of a good thing is too much. You have to find the right amount, and you have to do it correctly. What about that active person who has an injury but decides that he or she is going to tough it out? What do you say to that person? I tell them they're crazy. That sort of thing is not a good idea. The whole idea of playing through an injury or no pain, no gain, those are concepts that are obsolete. What we know now is that injuries have to heal. When I see a kid, for example, who's athletically active and they have an injury and they feel like they have to play, they want to be there for their team, most of the kids that I see, they play sports for fun. And I remind them that it's not fun when you're playing in pain. If you let an injury get better, you can go back and perform at your best. If you keep trying to push through it, you're just going to make it worse and you're going to probably lose the whole season. It's probably better to lose a couple of days and get better than to keep trying to push it and forfeit your whole season or possibly your whole career. If you'd like more information, please visit activeorthopedics.com. And to learn more about how to live true wellness, get a copy of Dr. Gross's new book, Get Well Soon, which is available on Amazon.com. Dr. Gross, thank you for spending time with us today. As always, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Joan. Always a pleasure to be here. We'll be right back. Are you worried about memory loss as you get older? I'm Dr. Lynn Corrigan, an anti-aging and regenerative medicine physician with the Active Center for Health and Wellness in Hackensack, New Jersey. Alzheimer's disease is the number one worry of aging people, more so than cancer and heart disease. Conventional treatment focuses narrowly on a gene or neurotransmitter, and there are some medications available to treat it. But the brain is a flesh and blood organ, and shouldn't lifestyle interventions help prevent Alzheimer's disease, just like heart disease? The answer is yes. First of all, exercise. Aerobic exercise has been shown to improve several aspects of mental function by 20 to 30 percent. Mental exercise, such as crossword puzzles, helps to maintain mental ability. Nutrition is important too. Reduce dietary fat to 15 to 20 percent. Also, maintain a healthy weight. A high fat, high calorie diet leads to inflammation and a decline in mental function. Supplements, such as the B vitamins, vitamin E, and phosphatidylserine, have been shown to help memory. Stress reduction, such as meditation, is important. High levels of cortisol, the stress hormone, have been shown to cause inflammation and brain cell death. Meditation has been shown to reduce the inflammation, and meditation increases DHEA, a hormone which helps memory. DHEA, estrogen, and pregnenolone need to be at optimal levels to help memory. What is good for the heart is good for the brain. For more information, visit us on the web at theactivecenter.com. to live a happy, productive life, but sometimes we need a little help. Our Coach on Call experts provide strategies to help you cultivate effective life skills. Joining me today is Carolyn Curtis, image consultant and personal brand strategist at First Impression Style. Carolyn, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Carolyn, we've heard the expression, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So do first impressions really matter in our career? And how do we make a good one? Oh, first impressions are so important. And the really the most key factor here is once the first impression is made, it is lasting and virtually irreversible. Not impossible, but very hard to do so. You know, it's in that fleeting moment, that first impression is all we know about that person. It is human nature. It's how our brains work that we make assumptions about the people we meet. We assume that that information that's being conveyed to us in that first impression is accurate. If you make a positive first impression, we project that that person is smarter, more confident, and friendlier. And it can take many positive behaviors to overcome the impact of one initial negative behavior. So Carolyn, what can we do to make sure we make a good first impression? First impressions are comprised of three main areas, appearance, body language, and your mannerisms and your speech. Now, appearance counts for 55% of the overall first impression. So, you know, before we even say a word, boom, that first impression is made. 
So it makes sense that we make the effort to have a professional, polished appearance, which includes our wardrobe, hair, and makeup. That is your first step. Now, what's also important to realize here is how we put ourselves together is actually more important than being conventionally pretty. So really, what we're born with, we can work with. Now, we also want to make sure that there's no disconnect between your appearance and the message you want to convey. For example, let's say you're a lawyer. You need to dress like one. We have that image in our head of what a quote-unquote lawyer should look like. We shouldn't be looking like a rock star, for example, and dressing like that if we are a lawyer. Secondly, and you know, to me is my mantra, be confident. So here's my secret. Fake it till you make it. It is absolutely okay to pretend in a genuine way, to be confident until you actually are. No one will be able to tell the difference. Then the most awesome thing actually happens. If you feel and act confident, even if you're really kind of faking it, then others will react to you as if you are confident. And then the cycle is that you will actually start to believe and be confident. And lastly, to round out this topic of first impressions, let's talk a little bit about, you know, body language. It's very important to stand tall with good posture. This will actually make you look and feel more confident. And researchers say posture matters even more than your title, regardless of what your title you may actually hold, because it conveys power. Also, let's not forget, smile and bank eye contact. So simple. And have a firm but not crushing handshake. Carolyn, thank you for being here and for sharing your strategies to help us make a good first impression. If you'd like more information about Carolyn, you can visit her website, firstimpressionstyle.com. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that this information is for educational purposes only and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, you can visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, take part in the book club, sign up for the mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.